with similar tactics but a different objective, we'll hear next a talk about achieving racial equity-oriented results through impact investing. Sharon Alpert and Nathan Cummings of the Nathan Cummings Foundation and Fred Blackwell of the San Francisco Foundation have been thinking about and doing this work well before it was cool. As pioneers in the field, they were introduced by a common mentor, Carl Anthony, and hit it off as colleagues at a Philadelphia Equity Summit many years ago. Talking with Fred and Sharon backstage, I could hear an immediacy and readiness for their work. We each agreed that growing up in Jewish or black households where justice was a mandate, we have always known that there was a need and a way to create an economy that works for more of us, if not all. These two pioneers share an obvious respect and admiration for one another, and it's a privilege to hear them chat together about their work and leadership this morning. Please welcome to the stage Sharon Alpert and Fred Blackwell. Good morning, everyone. It is so great to be with all of you today and to get to focus on these really important conversations. It's uh, watching backstage, the focus on gender lens investing, now focusing on racial equity on the main stage is pretty incredible here at SOCAP. Uh, as you just heard, I'm Sharon Alpert. I am the president of the Nathan Cummings Foundation based in New York. We are a multi-generational family foundation that is focused on building a more just, vibrant, sustainable, and democratic society. And we aim to transform the systems and the mindsets to lead to a more sustainable and equitable future for all people, particularly women of people of color. Social justice runs deep in our mission and in our DNA. And over the last 27 years, the foundation has awarded nearly $500 million in grants to build social movements, support organizations, and individuals who are pursuing justice for people and the planet. So I'm really, really thrilled to be here today with my longtime colleague, Fred Blackwell at the San Francisco Foundation. And I can't wait for you to all hear about the work that he is doing. I want to thank Mission Investors Exchange and SOCAP for putting this really important track together on racial equity and impact investing. And I encourage you all to follow this track and see our colleagues who are speaking throughout the conference. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over the first question to you, Fred. All right, cool. What excited you about Mission Investors Exchange invitation to be part of a conversation about moving to action on racial equity and inclusion? There are a variety of things and definitely want to share them, but first just wanted to also uh, thank SOCAP and the Mission Investors Exchange for putting this together. I was saying on the call when we were preparing for this that it's actually kind of weird that we've been working together for so long and haven't been on the stage together, so I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for making this happen. Uh, there are really uh, two or three reasons that um, I was excited about doing this when uh, the invitation came. The first is that, um, is the first reason is because, you know, we at the foundation a few years ago decided to really just push all of our chips into the middle of the table around achieving a greater degree of racial and economic inclusion and equity at a regional level of scale uh, here in the Bay Area. Can you hear me now? Uh, good. Thank you. Uh, um, and so, you know, it always excites me to be able to talk about that. Uh, that work is very important to us. And here in the Bay Area, we decided to uh, have that kind of focus because what we saw was that we had all this kind of economic growth and opportunity occurring here in the Bay Area, but that access to it was pretty limited. Uh, and for many people, it was limited based on where they live or what their family's economic status might be or something as simple as their race and their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we thought it was really important for us as the community foundation serving the Bay Area to be responsive to that dynamic. And so for that reason, it was very exciting to be able to come here and talk about that work. 
But the other thing that was exciting was to be able to talk about the work that we're doing in relationship to impact investing. Uh, and the reason there for me is that, um, you know, impact investing uh, in a lot of ways does not actually achieve uh, racial equity uh, oriented um, results uh, without being intentional. Mm. Uh, and really, if, I, if you really think about it, uh, the fact that we are engaged in uh, social impact investing uh, in and of itself uh, doesn't mean that it's going to uh, improve the lives of low income folks, communities of color, unless we're being intentional about it. And so the uh, opportunity to talk about what that intention looks like uh, in relationship to racial equity and what we're trying to achieve, I think was another exciting uh, opportunity. Last thing is, you know, I spent most of my career in local government. Mm -hmm. uh, and in local government, you know, one of the things that was challenging, obviously, was navigating the politics and the bureaucracy uh, in order to achieve what we were trying to achieve. But the other thing uh, about local government uh, is that once you do all of that, the impact of your uh, investment in time and energy in the politics is really great. Uh, and in philanthropy, uh, while we have resources, the resources compared to local government uh, and the government in general are actually a fraction of what the public sector brings to the table. What that means for us in philanthropy is that we have to use all of our tools. Mm -hmm. It isn't just about grant making, it's about how we invest, it's about how we use and exercise our civic leadership. And I think the idea of being in a conversation around how we use all those tools to achieve racial equity was something that was exciting to me uh, as well. But what about you? Oh, well, you're just singing my tune, and this is why we're here <laughs> together. Um, uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm really excited because it's a, a pretty exciting time at Nathan Cummings. As I mentioned, I, I joined three years ago, and in March of this year, we made an announcement after a, a really thoughtful and an intentional process, another theme we share in common, uh, to align 100% of our endowment with our mission. Thank you. And we did this for the reasons uh, that you were just mentioning too, Fred, which is we believe that um, foundations should be about more than grant making, that the problems that we're focused on inequality and climate change are market problems and they need market solutions, but they need new market solutions. We need to drive capital in ways that drive sustainable and equitable growth that will create long-term value for people and the planet, and that how we invest our resources as foundations, how we use our influence and our voice, as Fred, you just mentioned, as investors are really powerful tools to make that happen and they're really underutilized tools in philanthropy as well. And we made this decision also really thoughtfully. It was a full consensus decision by our board. But we made it because of who was also at the decision-making table. And so when I think about racial equity and inclusion, I think a lot about who are making these decisions. We've had intentionality at the foundation since the inception. Our foundation has a deep and intentional commitment to making sure that our tables are diverse, our staff, our board, our independent trustees, our investment advisors. Some people might say that we've been stacking the deck for racial equity and inclusion. <laughs> I think so. Many of our advisors, some of our advisors are here at SOCAP. Lisa Green Hall was really instrumental in helping move our decision to 100% impact investing. And we believe that we need to push past the status quo. That we have to imagine, like I think everyone here at SOCAP does, that another economy is possible. That you can put capital towards social good. So that was one of the reasons I'm really excited about being here and being part of this conversation. Another is so many of our partners are here at SOCAP too, who are pushing on these issues and pushing past the status quo. We heard yesterday from Jessica Norwood that black households only have $11,000 in net worth compared to about $143,000 in average net worth in a white household. We have to come up with new solutions to these problems. And the Runway Project and the work Jessica Norwood is doing, uh, she helped create that when she was a fellow at the Nathan Cummings Foundation. So we're trying to put all of our assets, all of our resources, all of our tools mm -hmm. towards making this change. We've got grantiers here from Bally 
activist, Living Cities, who you heard from yesterday as well, Color of Change, the Center for Economic Democracy, the First People's Investment Engagement Program, which is focused on intersectionality issues, strengthening local economies, and addressing violence against women and young people in, indig in indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. There's a wealth of resources out there on these issues, and we are so proud to be with our partners here at SOCAP in this conversation. Great, thank you, Sharon. Um, I get to ask you another question. Um, what, how, so how does kind of the focus on racial equity, economic inclusion um, show up at Nathan Cummings uh, in practice? Like, mm. what does it look like? And can you also share some success stories and some challenges mm. with us? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so on this one, I want to I want to keep this theme of focusing on who is making the decisions, who's at the decision-making table, and also the underutilized tool of philanthropy using the power of being a shareholder, being an investor, right? Um, so we have been doing a lot of work over many years to focus on how we use our, our endowment to advance issues of racial equity inclusion on board diversity in corporations across the country. And we've intentionally focused this work on race and gender. And more recently, we're really focusing this work on the intersection between both of them, recognizing that our field has seen a significant amount of progress that has mostly benefited white women on corporate boards and not enough people of color. But let me talk about some of those successes. Uh, we focused and we engaged Oracle Corporation on board diversity issues that resulted then changing their language of their bylaws explicitly, stating that the nominating and governance committees will actively seek, I'm going to quote this, mm -hmm. women and minority candidates for the pool from which candidates are chosen. That makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, in partnership with our Harvard Law School Shareholder Rights Program, we ultimately persuaded more than 30 companies uh, to implement annual director elections. That means every year those seats come up for election, giving more possibility for diverse boards. We pushed for greater diversity on the board of discovery communications, and in 2018, 33% of shareholders, representing about $2 billion worth of invested capital, supported that request for the board to include women and people of color in an initial list of candidates. But we're also seeing some challenges with some of those same companies making good on those promises. Uh, I'll mention a couple of other areas we're looking forward to heading into 2019. We're going to use our standing as a shareholder to put forward a proposal to a large retailer highlighting the risks associated with pri prison and diversion programs for labor in the supply chain, which we know mm -hmm. is a huge racial equity issue. Mm -hmm. Good. Good Thank stuff. Thank you. Good stuff. It's great to have your partnership, Fred. Yeah. So let me ask you the same, or a, a question we're focused on your work, leading yeah, a community sure. foundation here in the Bay Area. You're, we're here in your, your turf. Yeah. Um, as one of the largest community foundations in the United States, how does that help shape your racial equity and inclusion efforts, uh, particularly thinking about your portfolios around impact investing? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned uh, before when I was saying how excited we were to be here, um, I mentioned that we uh, had really pushed all of our chips into the middle of the table around uh, racial equity. It is now the North Star uh, for the San Francisco Foundation. It really impacts and cascades down through the entire mm -hmm. um, organization and everything that we do. The way that it manifests itself in practice is that we actually went away from organizing ourselves around the tra traditional um, philanthropic areas like community development, community health, arts and culture, education, environment, et cetera, and are now organized around what we're kind of characterizing as the, the pathways to equity, uh, which loosely uh, kind of focus in on the concepts of people, place, and power. Uh, and uh, we've created uh, centers of work around each one of those bodies of work that focus in on uh, building uh, political voice and power and uh, advocacy strength for low-income communities and communities of color. We focus a lot on that 
We focus a lot on uh, economic mobility issues as well under uh, people and under place. We have done a lot of work trying to focus in on how we can prevent both kind of housing and cultural displacement that's occurring in uh, different parts of the uh, community. What it also translates into is that we consider under each one of those headlines or areas of work, grant making opportunities, investment opportunities, and leadership opportunities, right? Uh, and the thing that's great about being at a community foundation and challenging about being at a community foundation is we have this twofold kind of business uh, model. One is we do our grant making with uh, the endowment, uh, but we also have donors uh, at the San Francisco Foundation. So of the 1.4 or $5 billion assets under management, probably about five to 600 million of that is with donors doing their philanthropy through us. Uh, and so when we think about uh, our impact investing work, not only do we think about it in terms of the foundation's endowment, but we also try to think about opportunities to engage donors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for our program related investment program, uh, what we did was we uh, carved about, we started with uh, carving $5 million out of the endowment and then inviting um, donors to participate. And so they participated for a one-to-one -one matching basis with us and created a $10 million pool. And that what was unique about that is the donors were willing to contribute without knowing what the projects were, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're co-investing with donors on things like affordable housing production, on things like job creation, and in communities in the Bay Area where we think we can have an impact from an equity point of view. And it's been so uh, important and successful to us that we've doubled that investment and we are now doubling the, the ask of donors to invest with us. So I think that that's a really great opportunity for community foundations to kind of evangelize with donors that are in our midst to bring them into the fold with us. And we uh, are on the brink of uh, launching a $50 million mission-related investment uh, program where we can do not only loans like we do with PRI, but make equity investments that align with our, our other equity mission uh, uh, as well. And we're inviting donors to be a part of that too. So I think that's really the opportunity mm. for community foundations is not only kind of how we think about deploying our assets, but mm -hmm. how we also help donors deploy their assets in ways that bring all the tools into the uh, stream as well. And so we're really excited about that. Um, and, you know, there have been a few things that we've been able to do that have been really great. So uh, through our PRI program, we have made investments in line with public funds that have been available for affordable housing production so that affordable housing uh, advocates and producers can go out and acquire property and then draw down the public money. Uh, we made an investment in a group called the Green Lining mm -hmm. uh, Institute that wanted to secure space in downtown Oakland for nonprofits who were focused in on equity related issues in a time when uh, commercial space was so expensive that these kinds of organizations were being pushed out of downtown Oakland. Uh, and so it's just a great opportunities that I think exist when we think about how we deploy all of our assets. That's amazing. You're, uh I, I want to ask how your, your staff and your board sort of see that like rewriting, right, of the focus, the North Star yeah. um, uh, in their roles. It's, yeah. a, it's a great question. I mean, we started off, um, frankly, with being very focused in on racial equity and economic inclusion and how we were going to draw a line and have impact in the community. Uh, and there are a lot of folks who actually start that work with doing an internal examination around mm -hmm. uh, equity and how it, how it impacts the organization. Um, one of the things that was interesting about it, and this is a whole nother story, but I was really emphatic about the fact that we needed to draw a line around what we were trying to achieve externally, mm -hmm. which means that we are just now having the conversation mm -hmm. around internal equity and what that means for us in exploring uh, our own biases, our own in internal infrastructure, and making sure that it aligns with the kind of bold declarations mm -hmm. that we're um, um, declaring around what we want to do um, externally. So um, we have now uh, a group of folks at the foundation who are very excited about this work. And while I was the one pushing for us to go in this direction early on, now I'm the one being pushed and being told that we're not doing enough around certain things. So it's a great kind of turning of the curve in a lot of ways around uh, how we think about this stuff. And I would say from a board perspective, we have been really blessed to have 
um, a board that has been grounded uh, in uh, the concepts of kind of having regional impact and being social and economic, the um, social and economic just, uh, justice inclined. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it wasn't a, a tall order uh, to convince our board that we needed to go in this direction, but it has been, um, frankly, a challenge to think about as a board, not only how they provide effective and good governance to us, mm -hmm. but how they're partners with us also in achieving racial equity. Uh, and so that is kind of, and when I say it's a challenge, it's a challenge because these are volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are folks who we're actually uh, asking them to stretch the, their kind of capacities and muscles in, in ways that they haven't been asked to in the past. It's amazing. Um, well, you told me I was allowed to bring in a question we weren't expecting, and that one, um, <laughs> I'm really glad I did, and it's so, uh, similar, you clearly have, are hiring the right people if they're pushing you to do more. Um, and again, you're rewriting the playbook and that, that requires new plays and, and new ways of thinking. Um, Great. So it's really exciting to hear it. So Sharon, let me ask you kind of, what's your vision for the future of this work, uh, both in terms of kind of racial equity and inclusion, but also in terms of impact investing? Mm -hmm. Like where are we going? Where would you like to see us go? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, like you, I think when you change the North Star, you change the goalposts, um, so much changes uh, really, I think, much more quickly than, than you can even imagine because now everyone's aligned, right, to that new North Star. Uh, so even though we're pretty early on in having just uh, announced this commitment, but building on a long track record of, of um, focusing on these issues, uh, both being a field builder and uh, an early founder of things like the Principles for Responsible Investing, we actually weren't using that as the charge for our own internal mm -hmm. uh, investment practices. And so we're already seeing those changes, having made the decision to align 100%, that it's now having us ask different questions internally, as you just mentioned, um, as well as um, how we're deploying our networks and our assets in the field. Um, we know that in order to fully mobilize uh, capital to underserved communities or in alignment with the big challenge of addressing climate change, that we have to really re-examine our playbook. And, um, and we know that you know, this is why SOCAP has been uh, organizing these conversations in the big tent we heard uh, about yesterday. And we really need, as you were also saying, you know, all hands on deck uh, to make that vision a reality. So some of the things that we're trying to do internally and that we're really learning with our partners in the field, joining groups like Mission Investors Exchange and Confluence Philanthropy and uh, new affinity groups that are really focused on uh, racial equity and racial justice in the impact investing space um, to help us, right? Like learn from others who have been doing this as I think we're creating the new playbook for the field. Um, so one thing we're doing new internally is requiring diversity and inclusion metrics from our outsourced CIO, our chief investment officer. Um, what we've learned just by asking these questions is that about 20% of our investment funds are invested in women or people of color owned firms. And this compares to an industry average of about three to 9%. So, we're, we're doing above average, but we, as we heard earlier, there is still so much work to be done mm -hmm. to make sure that those investments align with our mission and that really push the practice. Mm -hmm. uh, we're re revising our investment policy statement to make sure we do that, to make diversity and inclusion an explicitly explicit part of our underwriting and our governance. Mm -hmm. Again, if you change the rules, right, then um, you change the rules of the game, then you're playing a different one. Um, and we're actively sourcing and evaluating investment opportunities to improve that access to capital mm -hmm. for diverse fund managers. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, as we've heard on this stage, um, there's a lot more work to be done. And uh, I think our vision is one that will not happen overnight, but we know we've moved the goalposts mm -hmm. and that's, that's, right. that's, a, that's a big piece of it. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Fred? What's your vision? Yeah, so, you know, as I said at the beginning, I mean, racial equity-oriented results um, are not uh, achieved without intention. Mm 
Uh, and I think uh, my hope for where uh, this goes uh, is that um, impact investing uh, ends up in a place where um, there is very clear um, and tangible positive impact for communities of color um, associated with this shift. Uh, and I think to get there, uh, it requires a lot of what you uh, mentioned. I mean, it, it requires us being uh, clear about what biases we have in our institutions, uh, what kinds of policies and procedures are um, uh, not enabling us to achieve that. Uh, and what it looks like, I think, on the ground is not only uh, are we uh, utilizing uh, more diverse managers in, uh, in terms of uh, gender, also in terms of race and ethnicity, um, but those diverse managers are also guiding us to investment opportunities that uh, exist within uh, uh, institutions that are led by people of color mm -hmm. as well. Um, and that beyond that, that that means that there is demonstrable impact in the communities that we care about. So uh, I think a great example of that uh, to me, I was introduced by a woman named Keisha Cash, who I think probably some mm -hmm. people are familiar with the group named uh, Maven that she was investing in. Uh, and that group really took advantage of uh, the fact that you go, you've got an African-American and community of color uh, business opportunity that exists with folks who are in the kind of cosmetic and, and hairdressing uh, uh, industry, in the hair care industry, and the, the barbers and the hairdressers don't actually have access to the part of the economy there that is the most, uh, has the most high uh, impact associated with it, which is actually selling the hair. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they create a platform whereby the barbers uh, and the hairdressers can have access to a platform where they can sell the hair as well. I mean, that is a perfect example of the fact that if less there's a person who actually comes from that community and has investment from that community, it's a business opportunity a lot of people just wouldn't have seen, and it creates an opportunity for economic growth in a community that wouldn't necessarily have had that level of economic growth. Mm -hmm. More of that is think I, where I think we need mm -hmm. to be. Absolutely. It's really, uh, I, I would add, too, that we're talking about really democratizing the economy, creating access for those who haven't, and creating that vision of a just and sustainable and equitable economy uh, right. that is possible. Right. But it pushes beyond the status quo, um, and it's going to require some pretty bold and visionary people. So I, I hope there's a few of them in the audience today. Right. Cool. <laughs> And it looks like I, we're over time, right? So I think we need well, to wrap up. It was fabulous to be up here with you. Thank you, Fred. Fabulous <laughs> to be with you. All right.